Okay. Good morning. I will now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. It is 9 a.m. Thursday, March 2nd, 2023. Our first in-person meeting since the beginning of the pandemic. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see your faces in person. Recording in progress. And we'll begin with a roll call, clerk, whenever you're ready. And whenever we found a, a seat for Commissioner Pegler. There's there's some seat time, and I'll get your name. I'll get your name there. Commissioner Peterson. Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Con Commissioner Cummings. Here. Commissioner Quinn. Present. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner Alternate Virginia Johnson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commission Alternate Pegler. Here. And Commissioner Rotkin. Here. Uh, Commissioner Eats, are you on? Let's see if we need to. Commissioner Eats is not on there yet. Oh, the Commissioner Eats is here. He raised his hand. All right, great. We have a quorum. Are there, I don't, I think I see everyone here, but is there, are there any AB 2449 requests to consider? And so just so everyone understands, this is uh, in the future, if you do have an emergency and want to exercise um, the remote meeting um, capabilities under AB 2449, this would be the time when we would recognize that. And the, I believe the commission has to ultimately vote to accept those, uh, those circumstances, right? I'm seeing nod, so okay, I'll take that as a yes. Do we have any AB2449 requests today? All right, I'm not, not seeing any. I assume we'd hear them from someone online. All right, any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agenda? Yes, thank you, Chair Koenig. There's a replacement page for item 15 and a handout for item 23. <laughs> Thank you, Executive Director Preston. We'll now proceed to item four, oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. And we'll proceed. Is there anyone here in chambers that wishes to address the commission? Seeing none. Clerk, do we have anyone joining us online? First, Mr. Peoples. Mr. Peoples. Mr. Peoples, good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. This is Brian Peoples from Trail Now. I'd like to say it's really nice seeing you all there, but uh, I'm actually not a big supporter and I'm a little frustrated that, uh, and I'm sure you are as well, that the uh, the government hasn't um, given you that opportunity to continue to do remote meetings. That is a failure on their part, and it's and, and it's very frustrating. So, with that said, I, I just have actually a question on um, on the consent agenda. There's two items on there that I wanted to make a comment on, and and I'm not sure if the consent agenda is a one item or if it's or if those are two items. And not that I'll take up a lot of time speaking to them. I just wanted to understand um, when I comment to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm sorry. I think you can make it. You can make comments on the consent agenda now or during the consent agenda yeah, comment the period. Commission wishes you can make the comments now on the consent calendar items. I was just going to wait till the consent sure. items come on, but we'll, we'll call for sure. We'll call for consent. Uh, Comment on the consent items when we reach that point. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else online? Mr. Michael Pisano. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the staff for the hard work they did to get the hundred million dollars for the grant from the federal government. That was awesome. The thing I was wondering if a 
cost benefit analysis can be done in the next month or two to see if it's more beneficial for our community to complete the rail trail in two years opposed to five or 10 years when that 100 million is gonna be a lot less money. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pisano. Michael Saint. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Koenig, and good morning, commissioners. Nice to see you all lined up for a change. Looks like the past many years ago. Um, I have done my darndest to try and reconcile or somewhat be accepting of the RTC's Oxlane project. Uh, a lot of the people I talk to just say to me, it is what it is. Uh, that's one of my least favorite expressions. When I hear that, it gives me a feeling of defeat as well as a uh, laziness in a person who does not want to take action for something they see that's inappropriate. So I've come to the conclusion that hearing from the RTC and Caltrans that these Oxlane projects will improve traffic and safety operations needs a consistent rebuttal from CFST. According to the Unified Core study, your transportation experts, innovators and in transportation series hosted by the RTC, Expanding highways in order to reduce congestion is a futile exercise due to increased traffic induced by the expansion. The Caltrans draft EIR 2015 said that a TSM alternative, which includes the four miles of ox lanes, would provide very little congestion relief and that there would be more delay in the southbound direction in the evening commute. So in conclusion, as long as the RTC and Caltrans continues their false assertions to the public about future and sustainable congestion relief and safety and leading the public astray by continuing to use the term bus on shoulder, CFST will continue to educate and keep the public informed of these false slogans of congestion and relief and safety that the RTC and Caltrans consistently promote for Oxlane Project. The best outcome for our county and frankly our world is when we have an honestly educated and scientifically informed voter base, not one that has been misled through campaign rhetoric and special interest groups. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Uh, JB. Oh, hi, uh, this is uh, <laughs> Jack Brown from uh, Aptos. Uh, just had a quick question in regards to uh, the uh, uh, proposed rail car storage that's been sitting in limbo for several months. Um, uh, we had a, a good set of information at the executive director's uh, uh, report last month and hoping that he uh, comments on it again this time. Um, again, since we've seen from the last uh meeting the uh terrible incident that happened in east palestine ohio and the environmental disaster that followed with that um we i believe as a community do not want to be storing rail cars uh for uh, oil refinery and martinez in our community and hoping this is put to bed once and for all and that roaring, roaring camp stops selling out our community thank you thank you mr brown we do not have any other speaker. All right, thank you. Then we will proceed with our consent agenda. Does any member of the commission wish to pull an item from the consent agenda or comment or have questions on items on the consent agenda? All right, seeing none. Does any member of the public wish to comment on items on the consent agenda? Mr. Brian Peoples. <laughs> Thank you. This is Brian Peoples from Trail. Now I wanted to comment on two items that you're bringing in the experts from the city and a consultant to deal with eminent domain or dealing with property lines. Um, you know, that's just a, a heads up to the community that the government is going to come in and start doing eminent domain and looking to take property, which, you know, we understand that there is a need for that when you talk about transportation. You know, one of the things that I want to make sure the public understands is people will say they bought a house next to the freight to the railroad tracks and they should expect it. Well, no, they bought a house next to a freight line that had one train a day. So the idea of having 60 trains a day flying 60 miles an hour, 10 feet from your home isn't really realistic. It's really 
uh, basically moving the highway and creating a highway. If you had a, a, a road next to your house and the government came in and said, we're going to build a, uh, a highway next to your road, to your house. And that's essentially what's going on when you talk about doing that. Um, one of the things that you'll find is um, there is an easement like in Aptos Village where it actually, the deed of the property says that you shall not only have freight rates. And that's a big issue. The property owner is aware of it. The RTC didn't understand it because their title company made an error in the in it, and they're doing a design based off of that error, and they don't understand it. So I encourage you to do it. And finally, just as a note, we have reached. We're reaching out to the population that lives within 300 feet of the corridor. We're not looking to um, prevent and stop it. We're looking to help. We want you to be successful. We want us to be successful on opening up the coastal corridor. But we also want to reach out and give the community, those individuals, you know, somebody else to talk to about this because it's it's scary when the government comes and tries to levy stuff on you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. We do not have any other speakers. All right, then I'll return it to the commission for action. Approval of the consent agenda. Second. Motion from Commissioner Rotkin, second from Commissioner Brown. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk. Uh, I believe we actually do not need to take a roll call vote since there is no commissioner joining us online. Is that correct? All right. Woohoo. Woohoo. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Should ask for abstentions too, I suppose. Oh, any abstentions? Okay. <laughs> Seeing none, that motion passes unanimously. All right, we will now proceed with item 19 on our regular agenda, the commissioner reports. Does any commissioner wish to share anything? Seeing none. We'll proceed with item 20, which is commissioner appointments to committees. And I think I'll just provide an, an oral report on some of the nominations to our uh, standing committees and other committees. Um, so for the Budget Administration and Personnel Committee, I'm recommending that uh, we actually remove the second supervisorial district representative from that committee just because they've had trouble making those meeting times. As we uh, all know, Supervisor Friend um, has a conflict of interest that prevents him from participating. And I believe his alternate uh, Commissioner Rob Quinn um, also has a conflict at that time, which is a Thursday afternoon uh, at one thirty. So in order to make it easier for us to have a quorum, I'm suggesting that we remove this um, second supervisorial district representative. I'm nominating both Eduardo Montesino uh, and Kristen Brown uh, for that um, commission as our committee as well. Um, we don't necessarily need both of you, but you're we're welcome to to come if you can make the time. Our primary concern is just being able to have a quorum so that when we do show up, we can actually conduct the meetings. Yes, uh, Commissioner Rockin. Have you had a chance to ask them whether they're likely to be able to make those meetings? So I only have a reason I ask because you have a quorum problem if they regularly can't right. come. I'm, I'm seeing nods from both of you. So yes. if that's the case, uh, I, again, I'm happy to nominate both of you for uh, for the committee. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, and just Director to be clear, President. then the other four supervisors would also be nominated, and that would be Chair Koenig. Uh, Commissioner Hernandez, Commissioner Cummings, and Commissioner McPherson. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Then for a uh, representative with CalCog, I'm uh, recommending Commissioner Friend, who has uh, held that position now for some time and uh, has established some good representatives or, or relationships. For the Coast Rail Coordinating Committee, I'm recommending Alexander P Peterson as our primary and Mike Rotkin as the alternate. I believe that's everything. Are there any comments or questions from commissioners? Okay, seeing none. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on this item? We have no one here in chambers. Is there anyone online? Yes, Commissioner uh, Koenig, we have uh, Brian Peoples. Hey, hey, this is Brian from Trail Nails. What a surprise. I'm trying to, I know the meeting's moving really fast. But uh, I wanted to make a comment on selection of uh, committees. And, and I see Supervisor 
Cummings is there and welcome to supervisor. Uh, and I don't mean to give you a hard time. I sent you a note on, um, I don't typically give commissioners a hard time. I'm sure some others think I do, but I try not to. So I just want to say welcome. But in our note to you, um, there's a frustration uh, with the with the community when we we only have built 1.2 miles of a 32 mile trail over a decade. We're going to clear cut over 400 heritage trees. Excuse me, Mr. People. I just want to make sure your your comment is on the topic of these nominations to committees. Yeah, I'll I'll stop. You know, I don't want to burden us with this. Uh, but anyways. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Koning, for directing me. Appreciate that. Over. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Any other comments online? We do not have any other speakers. All right, then I'll return it to the Commission for Action. Move approval of the nominations. Second. All right, motion from Commissioner Rodkin, second from Commissioner Brown to approve the nominations to various committees. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes unanimously. We'll now proceed with item 21, the director's report. Executive Thank Director Preston, please. Thank you, Chair Koenig and uh, members of the commission uh, and the public. Um, I have a few housekeeping um, items to discuss. Um, since our last meeting, there has been one additional appointment to the RTC. Uh, Santa Cruz Metro has appointed Watsonville City Council Member Vanessa Quiroz Carter to replace the appointment previously held by Watsonville City Council Member Ari Parker. As mentioned by Commissioner Montesino at our last meeting, uh, the City of Watsonville appointed Watsonville City Council Member Casey Clark as his alternate, and the Board of Supervisors has appointed Watsonville City Council Member Maria Orozco as his alternate. <clears throat> and if you have not heard yet, Caltrans District 5 has appointed Scott Eads as their new District 5 Director. For the past three years, Scott served as Deputy Director of Planning, Local Assistance and Sustainability, and has often attended our meetings on behalf of Tim Gubbins. I've worked closely with Scott as part of the Central Coast Coalition and on advancing various regional planning studies and projects throughout Santa Cruz County. Scott is collaborative and makes great a, a really great partner. Uh, congratulations to Scott on his promotion. Here, here. Uh, with this appointment, Scott has also become RTC's ex officio commissioner representing Caltrans on the RTC. Uh, Scott is uh, here on Zoom today and will be providing a Caltrans report immediately following my report. Mm. Um, now that the state of emergency has been lifted and RTC has resumed regular in-person meetings, RTC has also decided to rotate meeting locations amongst the jurisdictions as we have traditionally done. Next month, the RTC meeting will be in Watsonville and city council chambers. We will be providing parking passes to commissioners and are working on the details on how to get them to you, hopefully in advance of the meeting. Um, although all voting commissioners must attend in person unless an allowance is made under AB 2447 or 2449, excuse me, RTC will attempt to provide remote participation options for members of the public, uh, public agency staff and ex officio officers. However, it is important to note that if technical difficulties result in the loss of communication for remote participants, the RTC will work to restore the communication. However, the meeting will continue while efforts are being made to restore communication to the remote participants. We value public participation and apologize in advance for any uh, potential disruptions for those who at choose to attend by Zoom. I mentioned there is a replacement page for item 15, which is a three month look ahead schedule. Uh, the schedule does not show any TPW meetings through May. These um, meetings are something we plan, uh, something we do not plan to continue uh, with monthly um, and wanted to ensure that you can use that time for other purposes. Um, we have also, but we have stopped short of canceling them for the entire year um, as we are considering resuming at least some of these meetings once we get started with the rail and trail concept report. Um, but it'll be several months before we know exactly when those meetings will be needed. We're still working on getting that contract signed. Caltrans needs to complete their audits and investigations on the contract. 
Um, per the replacement pledge, we do plan to have a, a budget administration and personnel meeting on Thursday, May 11th at 1.30. And, and instead of scheduling the BAP meetings as every other month, we uh, now plan to schedule them that uh, will correspond with our budget cycle. And there'll be about four meetings per year and we'll have an entire new schedule coming out shortly. Uh, I have an update on storm damage repair contracts. Uh, staff is working with Cal OES and FEMA on ensuring eligibility, eligibility for storm damage repairs. Beyond the commission authorization that you provided at last month's meeting, I have not yet authorized any additional emergency contracts, but I expect that I will be contacting the chair for authorization later this month for a contract to address at least two locations that we discussed last month. We are receiving and analyzing bid and formal bids while also working with the Army Corps of Engineers for their approval to move forward with emergency contracts. I will be discussing options with Chair Koenig and expect to have more to report out at next month's RTC meeting. Um, regarding the operator's proposal regarding car storage on the branch line, since our last meeting, RTC staff had a, a productive meeting with both Progressive Rail and Roaring Camp regarding their proposal to store rail cars on the rail line. They had previously asked RTC to hold back any consideration for car storage due to delays by the Marathon Biofuels plant seeking to store cars. We discussed the logistics and suitability of different locations on the rail line. RTC staff has communicated a preference for car storage to not be visible from Highway 1. However, those locations would require additional maintenance by the operator. <laughs> Progressive Rail plans to contact Marathon to get a better idea of the volume and timing of storage car needs. Staff will meet again to discuss potential options prior to bringing forward a future potential proposal, but there is no guarantee that the operator will pursue car storage on the rail line. Um, I have an announcement regarding Metro's One Ride at a Time program. Uh, the RTC is partnering with Santa Cruz Metro to support the launch of the One Ride at a Time campaign. The campaign goal is to increase transit ridership and, the, and establish Metro as an environmentally smart transportation choice for Santa Cruz County while supporting organizations making a difference in our community. To participate, riders must first create an account with the Go Santa Cruz County and um, log each transit trip taken. For every 25 transit trips logged, participants will have the option to donate $10 to either the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation or the Bay of Life Fund. The campaign will run through throughout 2023 and 2024, during which Metro will support the initiative with advertising, social media, community events, and will gradually release wrapped buses featuring photos of Monterey Bay from the Bay Life Project. By the end of 2024, around 30 wrapped buses will be traveling throughout Santa Cruz County, featuring captivating images of whales, sea otters, mountain lions, redwoods, and more famed wildlife uh, from photographer Fran Slanting. If you haven't seen those buses, there's two on the road today. They're absolutely beautiful. It gives you a whole nother perspective of riding uh, transit, which we should all uh, strive to do. Uh, staff will provide more information about the overall Go Santa Cruz County program at the April RTC meeting. Um, and regarding uh, RTC's um, mega award. Um, there was um, an event um, hosted on February 20th by Congressman Panetta uh, in Aptos to announce the $30 million mega grant received by RTC for the Highway 1 Bus on Shoulder Auxiliary Lane project, which includes Segment 12 of the Rail Trail and four new zero emission buses for Santa Cruz Metro. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend the event due to an illness, but RTC and Metro was well represented by RTC Chair Koenig and RTC, uh, uh, also MTC board member Koenig and RTC Commissioner Hernandez. Um, I would like to also thank RTC Communication Specialist Shannon Munz and Engineering Manager Sarah Christensen who helped prepare and represent RTC at the event. Uh, we were represented very well. Uh, Congressman Panetta 
is committed to helping Santa Cruz County to win grants and provide multimodal transportation options to serve his district. RC, RTC methods and strategies of inclusionary multimodal projects, which serve diverse communities, has proven, proven to be a successful recipe and is consistent with the voter approved 2016 very multimodal Measure D. You will hear more today from Sarah on the Watsonville Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor with item 23 on today's agenda. This grant helped fund one of many projects that RTC is advancing as part of this program. And with that, I conclude my director's report and hand it back to you, Chair Koenig. Thank you, Executive Director Preston. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Quinn. Uh, Now, I wonder if you could just walk us through the decision to store rail cars. Ultimately, whose decision is it? So we entered into an administrative coordination and license agreement with Progressive Rail, which includes the allowance of car storage on the rail line. However, it provides the commission with the authorization to decide locations that are acceptable for car storage. So car storage is permitted uh, per our existing agreement, but the RTC uh, commission itself can decide what locations are acceptable. And should the location require significant capital upgrade, who pays? That would be, um, you know, subject to our discussions with Progressive Rail. Uh, right now, we believe we've gotten that section of the rail line um, in um, the condition that cars could be stored up to mile post seven. Uh, they initially requested to store between three and four. Three and four is visible from the highway, which is why I would like them to, to potentially look at other locations. There is a bridge right at mile post four that goes over Harkin Slough. That bridge is not deemed out of service. However, our last inspection report indicated that some additional inspections should take place prior to um, um, moving forward with car storage um, uh, or, or any cars moving over that bridge. Um, so um, we did discuss um, work on that bridge and, um, and inspections of that bridge, and that's uh, something that would require additional capital outlay, outlay and is why um, they wanted additional information from Marathon as to whether or not revenue would be sufficient to help pay for that work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Any other comments or questions? All right, seeing so other comments or questions from, or from members of the public. Anyone here in chambers? Seeing none. Is there anyone online? Yes, we have JS. JS, you are uh, ready to speak? Actually, I don't have any comments. Sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brian Peoples. Yeah, I was at the, Brian, I was at the Panetta Aptos Village, and I just wanted to thank the staff. Um, I talked to Sarah, and she worked all night, I want to say, on building that storyboard or the visual. So she, and I think Shannon might have helped her as well. But so I just wanted everybody to know the work that she put in was extra effort. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. <clears throat> we do not have any other speakers. All right. And um, we'll return to the commission. I don't believe any action is necessary. I will just also add my thanks for uh, to RTC staff for a great event. Last week, it was a great opportunity to raise awareness for the mega grant that we have received, federal grant. And I'm sure we'll uh, get more information about this on our uh, item 23 coming up soon. So we'll now proceed with item 22, the Caltrans report. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Um, it's an honor for me to be selected and be here as your um, new district director. Um, appreciate the also the ability to be able to attend remotely today. I do look forward to making it there in person um, for some, at least some of the future meetings and really looking forward to working in close partnerships with this commission, um, executive director Preston and your staff. I have a few updates today. One is just a reminder on the Clean California Local Grant Program. 
I've, we've talked about this in the past um, cycle. Two call for projects was posted uh, middle of last month on February 14th. There's approximately $100 million available statewide for local beautification projects. And applications are due on April 28th. And there's an online workshop set for March 15th at 10 a.m. More information can be found at, uh, well, I won't give you the website. You can just look up um, Clean California Local Grant Program, and there's a whole website with a ton of details. If you can't find it, please see me, and I'm happy to provide it. Also, I wanted to highlight the Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grants. Um, again, we've discussed these in the past. There's nearly $85 million available statewide in three different grant categories. Applications are due at 5 p.m. on March 9th. So that one's Coming up, there's a Smartsheet portal. Again, you can Google um, Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning Grants and there's information there. See me if, if you can't find it. All right, I wanted to talk um, more about the um, road closures um, that are currently happening in Santa Cruz County on the state highways. Um, especially hard hit by the storms this last week. Um, we had hundreds of trees fall within the state highway right away. And uh, just yesterday, we authorized an emergency contract. We already have a contractor mobilizing to remove the trees um, and the related debris. And some of the trees that have fallen, we also need to remove the, uh, the roots um, and then provide slope stabilization. So all that's been authorized through a single contract for that emergency work. And we're gonna get out there and get it done as quickly as we can. More specifically to some of the closures on state route, nine, what we call the holiday slide. We still have a full closure there. It's closed between Lower Glen Arbor Road and, and Holiday Lane. Um, we're working to clear debris and to repair the damages. We have an estimate for one-way reversing traffic. Um, it has been pushed out to March 17th, pending weather and completion of some of the utility work that pg and &E needs to get in there and do. Um, and again, we're working is to get that open as quickly as we can. Um, once it's reopened, a temporary signal will be installed for one-way traffic control to re, um, so that we can continue on working on the retaining wall. Detour um, remains available on Glen Arbor Road and all businesses in and around Ben Lamont are open or remain open. Okay, moving down to, let's see here. Uh, Highway 135, well, there is still another closure, sorry, another closure, a full closure on Highway 9 um, from Trestle Pass Road to the junction of State Route 9 and State Route 35 um, due to uh, down trees and power lines and recent storm activity. So again, we're getting in there and trying to address that as quickly as we can. Um, on State Route 35, we have um, a full closure again. Um, due to some of the same events, and uh, we're, we're out there working with PG&E to clear the road and to get the debris cleaned up. And then on 236, same story, um, same sort of closure for the same reasons, and again, working with our crews and PG&E to get, get it cleared out as quickly as we can. Happy to take any questions. I'm happy to provide more details. There's a lot there um, in terms of the closures and the work we're doing. Certainly. Thank you for the report. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Yes. Commissioner Rockin. Just to congratulate Scott on his uh, new position. We appreciate that you've, you've earned it and we appreciate you in that position. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. Yep. Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. Um, and congratulations on being the new director and uh, Supervisor McPherson wanted to thank you for all of your hard work up in the San Lorenzo Valley in the fifth district. Um, Something that most people don't know, but I'll let you know now, of all the red tags that occurred because of the recent storms, 90% are in the 5th District and including, of course, these road impacts. So thank you for getting it cleared as soon as possible. The impacts on the side roads um, on the county roads that feed into Highway 9 are pretty severe right now. So we're hoping that you can get them the, the state routes open as soon as possible. So thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any other comments or questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Eads, for the report. We have um, public oh, comment. Oh, sorry, yes. Are there any members of the public that wish to comment on this item? Sarah Riggler. <coughs> I 
Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, good. Um, so um, I live in Boulder Creek, uh, close to Highway 9, and these road closures have severely impacted our daily life. Yesterday, I was, uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yesterday, it took me almost an hour to get back from uh, Santa Cruz with the detour uh, in Ben Lomond on, um, what is it? Uh, it's not Quail Hollow, it's uh, Glen Arbor. Um, so coupled with the fact that there's road closures and mudslides, um, it's even more dangerous to walk along Highway 9. And I wanted to ask um, uh, Mr. Edies, is that how you pronounce your name? I'm not sure. Um, you're on mute. But um, I wanted to ask him about, because you said it really fast, about the Clean California grants, um, because I'm interested in getting uh, walkways and um, bicycle routes on Highway 9 to make it much safer for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists to uh, walk or bicycle along Highway 9 without endangering their lives. So um, it's even more dangerous now because of the mudslides. It's even more narrow. So I'm I'm done with my comment. I'd like to just find out uh, the specific name of this grant. And you said contact you. So I'm ready to write it down. Go ahead, Mr. Could, Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Um, it's it's called the Clean California Grant Program. It's uh, and let, actually let me add a little bit to that. It's a Clean California or Clean CA local grant program. And if you if you just Google that, it will take you to a Caltrans website with um, a lot of detail. And it's really focused at focus, this particular grant program is focused on uh, beautification. Um, but it could apply to some um, ancillary pedestrian improvements, perhaps. So you'll just have to look through the specifications of the grant program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have JB. <clears throat> Mr. Brown, if you're there, yeah. go ahead. Oh, sorry, just got off of mute. Uh, Want to congratulate Scott too on the uh, on the promotion. Great to have you uh, on board permanently here. Um, also, want to thank Caltrans for all the great work on Highway 17. I'm a hybrid worker who uh, goes over the hill and really appreciate all the work that's been going on to keep that open for us and understand the days that it can't and uh, lots of great resources on, on figuring out days I get to work and days I work from home. Um, another thing I wanted to just bring up to the commissioners around this was um, a couple of days ago, um, I sent a note to Zach Friend about the conditions on Sumner um, and areas along the rail corridor where there are some trees and some very precarious conditions along there. And sure enough, the next day, a large tree fell across Sumner, um, blocked traffic. Um, the commuters that unfortunately get off of Highway 1 and come through our neighborhoods, um, you know, found other alternate routes through whatever source, lots of road rage going on. Um, and so um, I'm just hoping that the commissioners, you know, that um, have the ability can can coordinate with public works to maybe proactively look at some of the trees that are in precarious conditions. There's a lot of acacias that are like leaning uh, between Sumner and the uh, the corridor um, that probably should be maintained, um, and also encourage um, their constituents to use the My Santa Cruz County app for those of us in unincorporated areas and whatever the equivalent is for Santa Cruz and uh, uh, Capitola and Watsonville for the uh, incorporated areas hopefully so that we can keep these roads clear and also have a lot of focus on these alternate routes that unfortunately people are using in their community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. We do not have any other speakers. Chair. Sure. Yes, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Forgive me, I, I didn't mean to jump in, but um, you know, just listening to some of the comments with respect to road closures, and I think Commissioner John, Johnson could answer some of my 
um, concerns. You know, to me, how many how many of the roads that are closed are private versus the ones that are public? And um, it, it just occurs to me that we are a transportation commission, right? And as much as we try and deflect the fact that everything should be clean and everything should be multimodal, there is a place for asphalt every once in a while because probably everybody in this room probably drove their car on it today. Um, and we place the, the people in the fifth district in a pretty precarious position by not attending to the needs that are obviously there. So I would just remind the commission and everybody that we do have a responsibility in some of these situations and not just to kind of let you know, nature take its course and then be uh, reactive, but being proactive every once in a while as far as transportation is concerned is not a bad idea. Sure. Yes. Yeah, um, we recently asked for um, the statistics on private roads versus public roads. And as you know, the county maintains 600 miles of public roads. The city of Scotts Valley has its own roads that they maintain. Um, but in comparison to private roads, there are three times as many private roads in our county, countywide, as public roads. What you've highlighted is the issue, one of the biggest issues. Um, I can tell you we get daily contact from folks who want removal of precarious trees, especially along the state highways. And that's for and that's for our new um, District Five uh, director. Um, and often we have to wait until they do f fall down before we address them. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of not wanting to be proactive so much as resources. So when you have a series of storms as we just had, the resources that we have available to us to address everything pretty quickly is just not there. And so it comes in layers and, but the proactive aspect is very important. And I would encourage Caltrans to look, to be more receptive to removing uh, at-risk trees along the highways, um, but especially uh, proportionately, disproportionately, the fifth district and the North County where uh, Supervisor Cummings is, is disproportionately affected by all of these um, climate change um, events that are only going to get worse. Um, my fear is that we're going to have to be in disaster mode all the time. And we've talked about it extensively up here. Um, so yeah, to your point, um, it, it's a problem and um, resources are not as much as they need to be to proactively address. Thank sure. you, Commissioner. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for the discussion. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? All right, seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Eads, for the report. All right, we'll proceed with item 23, an update on the Watsonville Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program from Senior Transportation Engineer, Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Chair. I do have a PowerPoint. I'm just going to wait for it to be brought up. Brian, you can go ahead and share your screen. There you go. Okay, give me one second here. I need to move it. Brian, can you take it off full screen for a second? Take it off? No, take it off full screen for just a second so I can move it to another monitor. Okay, I'm going to just start yeah. talking. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm Sarah Christensen of your staff. I manage the Watsonville to Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program. And um, today's update, uh, we have projects on all three corridors within the program. Um, we're going to give an update on projects uh, that are being developed along Soquel Drive, along Highway 1, and along the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. 
How are we doing on PowerPoint? I got some cool graphics I want to show. <laughs> yeah, ha happy to wait. I'm sure they are very cool. We are we are ahead. I, I don't think we've had such a short meeting in a long time. So I really wanted right. to. There we go. There we it's, go. it's up now. Okay, Brian, go ahead and do full screen. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll do the update on projects and we'll have a moment for discussion and questions. Next slide, please. So a little background about the program. Um, the multimodal corridor program is a result of um, a very robust planning effort uh, back that finished back in 2019 called the Unified Corridor Investment Study. And this, um, the UCS, if you remember, um, it looked at a comprehensive set of multimodal projects along these three routes, Highway 1, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line Corridor, and SoCal Drive and Freedom Boulevard. The program provides high quality transportation choices that promotes transit and active transportation modes, improves safety for all modes, reduces travel times and delay, reduces vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions, which improves air quality and public health, and advances equity by providing uh, low cost transportation alternatives, serving disadvantaged communities in South County and North Monterey County. Uh, RTC partners with uh, local jurisdictions, uh, mostly county, um, county of Santa Cruz, Caltrans, and the Santa Cruz Metro to implement this program. Next slide. So I'm going to give a quick update on the SoCal Drive projects uh, that are under development. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first is a project that's a little over five miles long along SoCal Drive that starts at La Fonda Avenue uh, right at the city limit line near Harbor High School and extends all the way to State Park Drive in Aptos. This project upgrades all of the signals. There's about 27 signals that are being upgraded. Um, these signals will be um, interconnected and um, smart, so they'll talk to each other and um, hopefully that means a long green uh, if you take SoCal Drive and hopefully it'll be green all the way. Um, so congestion relief, um, it also benefits the transit um, because obviously the, the buses are in the same congestion as everybody else is. Um, there's also uh, buffered and protected bike lanes proposed the entire length. There's a rapid rectangular flashing beacon crossings, which enhances safety of crossing pedestrians and uh, about 100 uh, ADA curb ramps being updated. So this is a big multimodal um, project, uh, the first phase of the project. And uh, it's really gonna transform SoCal Drive in this area. Next slide. Okay, let's see if I could pull this off. All right, so we have <laughs> ADA curb ramps. This is just a snapshot of um, SoCal Drive that shows all of the multimodal elements. Here's a rapid rectangular flashing beacon crossings shown there. Um, this is to improve safety for pedestrians crossing SoCal Drive. We have buffered and protected bike lanes, which shows enhanced striping and um, safety treatments for bicyclists. Mm -hmm along SoCal Drive. What just happened? <laughs> too much of a good thing. I know, it's too good to be true. Oh, well. Uh, okay, here we go. In-lane boarding platforms. So this allows the bus to stay in the lane. Um, what, what happens a lot of times is buses have to pull over to load and unload uh, passengers and that causes delay um, to getting back in. Not everybody is polite and they don't let the buses back in all the time. So that adding up over several miles can really um, increase the transit travel times. And so in-lane bus boarding platforms really helps the bus travel times and reliability um, and prioritizes um, the bus travel times over um, other modes, really. So um, the project also uh, includes sidewalk gap closures. So there's a lot of areas along SoCal Drive that just haven't gotten around to building the sidewalks yet. So this project will close those gaps. 
Um, next, there's other uh, enhancements such as new shelters, real-time displays. You could see that's an example of um, like the future um, bike share. Uh, we're trying to place those next to all of the transit stops and rail trail and active transportation along these three routes. And then finally, a uh, cape sale of the existing pavement is um, included as well. That provides a nice fresh surface or canvas for the new paint to go down as well as um, pavement rehabilitation properties. So uh, next slide. Let me add, it makes a huge difference to bike riders. Absolutely. Um, SoCal Drive, uh, the La Fonda to State Park Drive project, the um, construction contract is advertised. It's out to bid right now. So they're going to open bids uh, in the next couple of weeks and construction is scheduled to begin later this year and extend. It's about a year and a half to maybe two years, depending on weather uh, duration of construction. And then there's another project that the County of Santa Cruz is uh, developing and that's south uh, between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard. And that is under development. We'll be bringing more information as that becomes available. Next slide. Next, I'm gonna talk about Highway 1. So we have three projects under development as shown here. The phase one project is between 41st Avenue and SoCal Drive and includes the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at Chanticleer Avenue. Phase two, actually, no, I'm gonna go back to phase one. The, the schedule for this project, it's, it's under construction now um, and construction is expected to take about two years total. So end of, 2024, it should be complete. Um, phase two, uh, an additional three miles of auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder facility between the Bay Porter interchange and the State Park Drive interchange. The phase one and phase two projects together are about five miles. Um, and that project is going out to bid next week. So RTC serves as the implementing agency for the pre-construction phases of these projects. And then we hand the reins over to Caltrans and they actually advertise and award and administer the construction contract. So that process has happened. Um, Caltrans will be advertising uh, scheduled to go out next week and um, opening bids in April and uh, construction beginning late summer, early fall timeframe. Uh, the project includes, go back, thank you. Um, new bicycle pedestrian overcrossing at Mar Vista, also replacing the Capitola Avenue overcrossing with enhanced um, better shoulders, uh, bike lanes and sidewalks on that bridge. The phase three project is in the environmental phase. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this project and focus in on it. I brought some visual exhibits with me today um, for you to take a look at if you're in person here. Um, this project is uh, the last two and a half miles of the bus on shoulder and um, auxiliary lane facility. It's a transformative project that um, it includes one and a quarter miles of the coastal rail trail, one of the most challenging segments of rail trail. Um, there's two bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings proposed uh, over Highway 1, and then there's also two bicycle and pedestrian overcrossings proposed over SoCal Drive. So there's many bridges included in this project. Um, this project, we're scheduled to release the environmental document, which is an environmental impact report, um, environmental assessment, <coughs> CEQA and NEPA for public review and comment uh, this month. Next slide. Just wanted to show <laughs> um, the bus on shoulder facility and I always wanna show off my graphics. So uh, this is a, a view of, you know, up on one of the overcrossings, you could see the bus on shoulder operating and um, heavy congestion. So next slide. I mentioned the EIR EA uh, being released for public review in March. We are uh, planning a very robust uh, public process for this. Uh, we're planning both an in-person meeting and a virtual meeting. Um, and stay tuned for more information. Uh, we'll be uh, posting the environmental document on our website and doing um, email blasts and social media blasts, that sort of thing to get the word out to get um, as much public interest and comment as we possibly can. Next slide. 
Now we're going to talk about the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. Next slide. We have the Coastal Rail Trail under development. We have segments eight and nine to the left on your screen. Those are being implemented by the city of Santa Cruz. The project's just finishing up environmental and starting final design. Scheduled to go to construction, I believe, 2026 timeframe. Segment 10 and 11 are being implemented by the County of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. They are about six months behind, so they're going to be releasing their um, environmental document this spring. And um, I think construction timeframe <clears throat> is about the same, 2026, maybe a little later. And then finally, the segment 12 project, which is combined with the Highway 1 project we just talked about. We're releasing the environmental document uh, for public review this month and um, construction scheduled uh, pending availability of funds uh, for 2025. So segments 8 through 11 are fully funded. Um, the city and county received active transportation grants um, over $100 million in active transportation grants to fully fund these projects. Can I ask a question at this point? <clears throat> yes, Commissioner Rockin. Um, on 12, I've been asked by members of the public, on segment 12, the benefits of those improvements are both to the uh, Coastal Rail Trail Corridor and to Highway 1. Could you say something about who's paying for that? In other words, who, what it's being, which of the two projects is yes. being charged in effect with a cost, say a bridge that okay. serves the trail and the highway? So, um, okay, so the question is about funding, I'm assuming Measure D funding. Yes. So our Measure D funding, it's funded by both active transportation and highway corridors program. And there's a split based on um, what... Are basically like the overcrossings over Highway One um, are considered Highway One improvements, and so the that portion of the trail is paid for by the Highway Corridors Program, um, and then the remaining trail that um, is not over the highway is paid for by the um, Active Transportation Pot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for keeping me on my toes. <laughs> it is one project though, and it has many funding sources. We have the Measure D both programs, we have MEGA, we have um, State Transportation Improvement Program funds, and we're pursuing the Santa Bill 1 funds as well to fully fund this project. Next slide. Uh, as you know, the uh, RTC began um, developing the concept report for zero emission rail transit. The commission approved a contract back in December and um, and we haven't made a whole lot of progress yet, but we are um, getting really close to um, getting busy with this project. Next slide. Okay. Questions and discussion that um, concludes my presentation, Chair. Connor. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you for sharing your mic. I had two questions. The first is um, uh, the anticipated improvements in transit travel time when once the um, improvements on SoCal and the Highway 1 projects are complete. What was the beginning part of the question? Sorry. So, so we have sort of guesstimated the improved improved time it takes to get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Once um, the, the the Highway One projects are complete, bus and shoulder as well as the SoCal uh, project is complete. Yeah. Okay. So the <clears throat> we're partnering with Santa Cruz Metro to work with um, them on potentially creating a true. Uh, express route on Highway 1. So currently the 91X is the express route. It exits the freeway and then it gets back on. So there's some delay there, right? So with the route change and the bus on shoulder improvements, um, it's about between 14 and 17 minutes in each direction in terms of travel time savings. And, and the current would, travel time is something like 45 minutes to an hour? Oh, it's closer to an hour, yeah. Yeah, well, that's quite an improvement. And then, then I have one last question. Um, we are, um, I know we've talked about it many times uh, for segments eight and nine, especially with the city, because they're designing those segments. We And of course, the county as well, 10 and 11, we are getting maintenance agreements as part of 
that yes. those negotiations and collaboration? We haven't yet um, entered into maintenance agreements yet. Um, we will require um, a maintenance agreement before we give them a cooperative agreement for construction. Um, for the segment eight and nine, we should be uh, coming back uh, for the commission to look at uh, cooperative agreements for the design phase of the project in May. Um, we will consider possibly bringing construction uh, cooperative agreement as well. But like I said, uh, construction uh, or the ability to start construction and get a right of entry uh, would be dependent upon uh, having a maintenance agreement in place. So we could actually agree on the construction um, cooperative agreement, but we wouldn't give them a right of entry to construct and, until a maintenance agreement is in place. They're keeping that in mind as they design. <laughs> It's in it's in our policy, yeah, and we do bring it up in terms of you know the maintenance, and we've kind of come up with a strategy of, you know, here's here's the fence that divides the the trail area from the rail area, and everything on the trail side of the fence is going to be included in that maintenance agreement, and then the rail would be its own uh, you know responsibility for RTC to continue to maintain. Great, right. thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any other questions from commissioners? Sarah, I have two particular questions, two vexations on SoCal Drive. Four-way stop at Robertson Street. Seems kind of out of sync with synchronized lights and it's a huge bottleneck mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Any thoughts about alternate uh, traffic control there? I'm not positive what's happening there, but I could check with Russell Chen, who's the county project manager and see what is in store for that intersection I can in particular. speak to it a little bit. I mean, I know our long-term plan is to put a light at Robertson. Um, however, it's not funded within this project. So I think the goal is to probably um, ask future developments in the area to help fund uh, installing a light there. Vexation two is the lane distribution on northbound SoCal when you come to the San Jose SoCal Road in the morning. It's a choke point. Um, there's only one lane that goes through. You have to turn right or left on the other lanes. And I, I know this is very specific, but it is a huge 10-minute choke point uh, at northbound in the morning on SoCal by the fire station. I can speak to that as well because I've discussed this. It's, in, it's right in the middle of my district and I've discussed it at length. Public works, you know, we looked at, I forget exactly what the term is, but, um, you know, some kind of way to make both of those lanes through lanes and alternate, um, you know, which which side turns green so that people could still take a left. Um, it seemed like from the initial analysis that wasn't actually going to speed anything up. Um, so I think that's why it did not make it into the redesign plans. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So it, it strikes me that this is a pretty nice blend for people who are using their cars, but also the multimodal, particularly on SoCal Drive. Uh, it looks very impressive. And to Commissioner Rockin's point about, you know, making a difference for bicyclists. I mean, I think I'm doing pretty good, uh, like yesterday, uh, riding 10 miles on a bike. Uh, but when you do it on Scotts Valley Drive, which was renovated over 20 years ago, you feel relatively safe. And I get the impression that this is also going to serve bicyclists and pedestrians in a very nice way. So my compliments and um, I like the blend. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other? Yep. Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, um, under the slides that you had for the, the rail trail, um, there was no update for the, the portions in South County. Is is there an update or do you bring an update? Sure. Yeah. Future? Yes. Um, so I I apologize. I kind of ran out of gas on that last slide. The zero emission electric passenger rail project includes segments 13. So that's from Rio Del Mar Boulevard all the way um, to Pajaro Station. So segment 20. So 13 through 20 are included. And because um, the concept report is going to be looking at how electric uh, rail is going to look in Watsonville. Um, it, you know, we talked with city staff and determined that it is probably most wise to wait on 
further development of, um, say, future phases of segment 18 and potentially 19 until we have more information about how the transit facility is going to look in Watsonville because what we don't want to do is have the city go and build a section of trail and then later, you know, 10, year, 10 years down the road, have to rebuild it as part of the future project. So we're coordinating right now, we're assuming that the future remaining phases of the trail in South County are included in the, the rail project. Well, I'm going to push back a little bit so that you're telling me he's going to wait for 10 years for those projects to be. So currently that's the trails are included in the electric pasture rail project. However, if we get to a point where we answer questions and we have an idea of what the configuration is going to be, those trail projects can proceed. Um, we just don't want to, um, design and build something that's going to be, a, you know, either rebuilt or a constraint for the future rail project. I'm gonna, so like I said, I'm going to push back because it's like I said, uh, for uh, 10 years for us to not get any projects and everyone else to be getting projects and uh, for a delay, we're going to have to talk about this uh, stuff. Um, I got a meeting together. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Montesino. Any other comments for, or questions from commissioners? All right, seeing none, I'll take it out to the public. Does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Yes, uh, please approach the podium. Uh, good morning, Chair uh, Koenig and Commissioners. Um, Matt Farrell here for uh, Friends of the Rail and Trail. We uh, just want to congratulate staff and the Commission on moving forward with this multimodal plan especially with a uh, rail, zero emissions rail concept plan. And in full disclosure, uh, uh, what Ford's activities have been around this um, particular project, we wrote letters of support for um, the RTC's application and also uh, for the TERSIP application from Santa Cruz Metro Transit. And finally, we wrote a letter of support for TAMSI in their application for Pajaro Station, because we think this is a whole regional network and it's very important to support all these agencies that are working to realize the vision that's been adopted. So thank you for your time and your work. Thanks for your support. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone online? Yes, we have a few um, speakers, starting with Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Um, I'll point out Sarah's comment that this section, segment 12, is the most difficult. And we've only built 1.2 miles. And actually, the 12-foot wide trail that you've been building has been more expensive than widening the highway. So there's some barriers that we're creating in our plans. And the other thing that we don't understand or you're at least not accepting is mm -hmm. the Coastal Commission is not going to let you build a new train uh, along 20 feet from the ocean, like in Manresa. They're moving the train tracks south inland. So you're never going to get that money. So I think Watsonville representatives should really raise their hand as they did to say, wait a minute, we're not getting anything. We're not getting a trail. We're not going to get a train. And at the end of the day, we should be getting a trail to Watsonville. You know, the farmer and the private property owners from San Andreas Road to Lee Road are not going to let you have a train and trail. It's already called out as alternate B. So don't allow them to fake you out that you're going to ever get a trail and a train. So you really, really, really could have a trail in, in our lifetime from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, if we be realistic in our expectations. Um, so the other thing is, is you don't have all the funding for this effort. And so, you know, why are we building four new um, bridges in Aptos? Why aren't we using the existing infrastructure? Let's use the existing infrastructure. And then to pay for your train in the future, you allocate those funds for that additional bridge. Don't levy our trail with that additional cost today. Let's, okay, if you want to have a train in the future, which we know you can't, 
let's levy those costs there it, because you're going to delay the trail being built. And, and the evidence is already there. Look at North Coast Trail. It's been delayed for a decade. So I really hopeful that you really be realistic in your expectation on building the trail to Watsonville. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Our next speaker is Michael Pisano. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Great, great job. A um, couple of questions is between 41st and Robertson, uh, one side has a sidewalk improvements and the other side doesn't. There's a hill there. I was wondering if that could be included in the plan to add uh, a sidewalk on the south lane between 41st and Robertson. And um, also the stoplight at Robertson, I know that's approved, just no funding. I was wondering if those two funding streams that Mr. Eads from Caltrans, the Clean California Grant Program and the Sustainable Transportation Program could be help fund adding a sidewalk between 41st and Robertson and at a stoplight. Thank you, Mr. Pisano. Uh, next, we have uh, Michael Saint. Mr. Saint, if you're there, go ahead. I'm not un unmuted. We can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Koenig. Uh, yes, Sarah, excellent presentation uh, as usual. Uh, but let's just say we agree to disagree on whether this multimodal project overall decreases VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if the Oxlane project was a true bus on shoulder dedicated lane, I would definitely agree with your, your first statement on this presentation. Uh, your own EIRs all the way the TSM doesn't even say BMT increases by 29% once the projects are all done. Um, so that's my comment. I do have a couple of questions under attachment one, figure one. Uh, could you please explain the dotted blue line uh, that is entitled potential transit routes uh, using bus on shoulder slash ox lanes. I was a little confused with that, if that's a future possibility. Um, the second question uh, on your flyer shows a solid white line by that bus picture you showed on outside ox lane. Does that white line extend uh, from off ramp to off ramp or only under the uh, overpass bus on shoulder project? Uh, and then also I was wondering, there was nothing mentioned about any ramp metering. Just wondering if ramp metering was going to be part of the project as well. And once again, thank you so much. And I do especially want to thank you on your uh, flyer on page 23-6. Uh, you actually put in bus hybrid facility. Thanks for using the word hybrid. I appreciate it. Have a good day and uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Next, we have Jack Brown. <clears throat> Hi, this is uh, Jack Brown from uh, uh, Aptos again. Um, thanks again, for a great presentation there. Um, one of the big questions I had in the uh, rail corridor um, and uh, uh, controversy in the, the environmental impact report is the interim trail with a trail only option is being shown at 26 feet in width. No one, not even Greenway, requested a width of 26 feet. And I'm questioning why was that width used? Um, and uh, uh, it was this to show a greater tree loss um, than a rail and trail option. And there, as we know, we'll lose thousands of heritage mature trees along the corridor for no good reason when we don't have funding for a, a rail program there. And even the street in front of my house is not 26 feet. Um, it seems like it would have made more sense to have something at a, a 16 foot or, you know, even the, the 12 foot that's been recommended by others, but without having fences, unsafe steel and cable, steel post and cable fences along that route, but something that, that is safer for, for uh, active transportation to use. So uh, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next, we have equity transit. Hi, thank you so much. This is Lonnie Faulkner from Equity Transit. Uh, thank you, Sarah uh, Christensen, for that great report. 
and I would like to congratulate staff on this multimodal plan. And uh, we were honored to be able to support the TERSIP application. Um, just a couple thoughts in regards to the Soquel uh, project as a cyclist. This is very exciting to see that um, Soquel will hopefully be both a corridor for um, active bus um, activity with less traffic as well as safe for cyclists and pedestrians. One of the things I think about is uh, the safety of cyclists and pedestrians is directly correlated to the speed. And so as the lights are being timed, we hope that you will also incorporate traffic calming so that the speed of the traffic is maintained at a very safe level. This is one of the major issues that us as cyclists experience throughout the county is speed. Mm -hmm. um, also want to consider advanced traffic circles that are used in many um, cities across the country as well as the world. I know the cycling Dutch Cycling Embassy brought some of that information and advanced uh, project type of circles that we know work very well. Um, so that might be a nice consideration. Um, also want to consider that one of the lanes on Soquel is bus only and if any way to do that as well for the highway. Um, and also would like to request staff to consider seeking 30% engineering design and environmental impact report for passenger rail service as opposed to the 15%. And again, I appreciate your time and availability to speak. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. That was our last speaker. All right, then I'll turn it, return to the commission. This is not an action item, but it is an opportunity for any last comments or questions. Um, I can address one question that did come up during public comment from Mr. Pisano about a uh, sidewalk on 41st, uh, between 41st and Robertson on the south side. Uh, that is a fairly cliffy area. Um, it certainly would love to add sidewalks there, but I think, you know, we did ha have to acquire a right of way just below Robertson Road between Robertson and Dalbenbiss. Um, and so made some steps with this project towards a sidewalk there. I think the one between 41st and Robertson would just be prohibitively expensive at, at this point in time, although it's certainly something we'll continue to look at in the future. Um, and then I did want to ask uh, Director Preston, uh, there was a question really sort of related to um, rail trail design um, and the way that's being considered. My understanding is that in May, this commission will review uh, the EIR for segments eight and nine potentially, and that might be an opportunity for greater discussion on that item. Yes, that is that is correct. The uh, uh, City Planning Commission is um, meeting today to consider that project. And there is a possibility that could be appealed to the, uh, um, <clears throat> the full city council. And if it is, that would likely occur in April. So we're scheduling that to come to the RTC in May. Okay, so we'll we'll have an opportunity to discuss that uh, in greater details. I'm sure many folks on this commission would like to. Uh, other comments or questions, Commissioner Rockin? Uh, we we had a question or a comment from the public about traffic circles. Um, a lot of this route on Soquel is pretty constrained physically. Uh, but did we look at traffic circles or you know, was there, has there been any consideration of that? Or are there some of these intersections that for which that might be feasible? Because we have two traffic circles now in Santa Cruz that are working really well, uh, make a huge difference in time saving and they're safe. And people it took people you know a couple of weeks to learn how to use them. But now it's going really, really well. So I understand that it's not something you can just plop down on every intersection by any means. But it, what consideration have we had for traffic circles? So the county project um, that's about to go to construction, um, they did not look very closely at traffic circles just because of the reasons you mentioned. Um, they held the existing curb lines and avoided um, as much right-of-way acquisition as possible just because that turns into a lot of costs and potential delay to your project. So not to say, um, it, you know, it can't be looked at in the future, but it traffic circles do require a significant amount of right of way. I think we have two lanes in each direction on the main street, and That'd be it takes a, a big circle huge. to get people around that and spend you know safely and work in pedestrian and bicycle options so that that because that has to be safe as well. Right. So, so I get that. So it would be. I mean, it would be like entire properties on each corner in order to make that work. And there's many intersections, so it's. 
So it might be possible that some grant for efficiency or something in the future might be applicable and we might apply for that and make those kind of, where you have money for that kind of acquisition. That could, yeah, that could be looked at in the future. Commissioner Rockin, um, you're correct in that traffic circles require a lot more right away. Um, and I think that's why the county didn't try to include that. We we added this the SoCal Drive improvements to the Highway One project, which was um, well on the way to environmental clearance at the time that we applied for the grant. The city, uh, the county, was able to move forward with a categorical exemption um, from CEQA because there was no right of way needs on the project. If we were to have waited, we wouldn't have been able to apply for this grant and, and actually get this project funded. Um, but you're correct, traffic for circles do work quite well when they're placed correctly and, and um, the public starts to learn how to use them. Um, it would be something that the, the county could do as a future study. Um, but it would be a long lead project and something that would take probably around 10 years to, to develop on a, in a location like SoCal and, and, and a lot more cost. Thanks. I appreciate the responses. Uh, and I will add, uh, there is no shortage of traffic circle fans at the uh, DP, in the Department of Public Works um, it, with the county. And we are going to be doing a plot line study along uh, Capitola Road and looking at opportunities to put in traffic circles there. Any other final comments or questions from commissioners? All right. Well, again, this was uh, just a report item. I, I will, you know, add some remarks, which is this is going to make an incredible difference uh, in terms of transportation through Mid County. Uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to the results of some of these projects, and you know, of course, transportation and housing go hand in hand. Um, and I, I know as we consider the housing element this year at the Board of Supervisors, um, we'll certainly be looking at how these transportation improvements will allow us to uh, add more housing in Mid County. And hopefully, as we do that, we can prioritize housing for uh, our our working class people, and also get more cars off the road and provide people an option to get around. Around, uh, via alternatives like the bus, which will be running a lot better, and bikes, which will be in these protected and buffered lanes. Thanks to staff. All right. Again, thank you very much for staff for the comprehensive report. So that brings us to uh, our final item, which is next meetings. Next RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, April 6th, 2023 at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. Again, we're all meeting in person now. It will be in South County, not in this room. Uh, located at 275 Main Street, room 400, Watsonville, California, 950-776. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>